now. Uh, now, the first resignation from Labour's front bench over leader Sakir Starmer's stance on the Middle East conflict has been submitted. Shadow Minister Imran Hussein stepped down from his position overnight, saying his view on the conflict differed substantially to the position adopted by Starmer. Well, joining us now is The Times and Spectator columnist James Kirkup. James, do you think more front benches could end up following Hussein's lead? Be slightly surprised if if they do. I mean, he's a relatively unusual figure on the front bench or ex front bench. In that, he was from the campaign group. He nominated Jeremy Corbyn for you know, for leadership. There weren't many of people from that part of politics left on on Keir Starmer's front bench. So, um, yeah, he's a slight outlier in that sense. And the, you know, the, the tensions over over Gaza have been there for a couple of weeks. If, if people were going to resign, you know, maybe they would have done by now. So, um, not not really out but it wouldn't if if he, if, he, if 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 he ends up being the only one don't be surprised does it curiously uh, do starmer a favor in some respects i mean many are suggesting that starmer is ahead of sunak on his position it's a very solid position which some are not seeing in quite the same way from the conservative benches that's largely been projected onto starmer because of some disquiet from those back benches and of course some councillors that have resigned as well Will Starmer lose any sleep over losing this particular front bencher? Uh, he, he will, yes. I mean, you know, no, no, yeah, one front bencher is, is, is the tip of, of an iceberg here. There, there is a lot of discord within the Labour Party. So internally, this is very difficult and painful for the Labour Party. I'm not sure. I mean, the theory you're, you're getting to is the, the idea, the sort of Blairite triangulation theory, that if, yeah. he, if he can stand as a strong leader opposing the, you know, the left-wing fringe of his own party, he'll look good. I'm not quite sure Keir Starmer has quite mastered that sort of personal projection of authority yet uh, it could work out well for him but at the moment I think they're more stuck in that internal conversation where you know, they'll, you know, this, this is not this is not a happy day uh, for, you know, you know, for, you know, for for the Starmer team it's difficult though isn't it for these labor front benches or for, for MPs of, of any party really particularly those who represent uh, constituencies that have got a large Muslim population and whilst this shouldn't be about race or religion and, and presumptions shouldn't be made on somebody's stance on the conflict based on their religion. Um, there are an awful lot of Muslim voters who don't feel like they are being represented. There's an awful lot of non-Muslims like myself who see the bombing that's going on in Gaza, who see these Palestinian children dying in their thousands and feel helpless. And so feel angry in a way at people like Keir Starmer for not wanting to call for a ceasefire, even though that might be ideologically, you know, Naive. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, po politics comes down to explaining um, things and talking to people. And I think, yeah, we're not living in an age of uh, vintage political communicators. Uh, yeah, Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak, whatever else they are, they are not first class communicators who can explain in a way that emotionally connects to their audience why they are doing something which might be difficult. Uh, and so there, yeah, there is, a, I, I think, a perfectly cogent case to be made against a ceasefire, to say, how can you have a ceasefire with an organisation that wants to destroy you? How can you have a ceasefire with an organisation that is holding hostages, which is, a, which is a war crime? But no one is really making that case very well, which is why I think, you know, and I spoke to a you know, friend on the, on the Labour front bench about this the, you know, the other day, who said, you know, they, you know, they have a lot of people in their constituency who are, have that view. He said, in the end, politics, you, you listen and you talk. Yeah. You, it's, you, you've got to be able to sit down and talk to people and say, look, I've heard what you say. I'm not doing the thing you necessarily want to do directly. Um, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to judge me on that. that and that, that, simple, you know, that simple conversation isn't always happening so well because I think we haven't got, so we haven't got great communicators at the top of either, either of the big, uh, the big parties. It doesn't help with comments like Suella Braverman's of the past few days calling everything sort of a blanket statement saying that they're hate marches, etc. I think well, the, um, the, the marches issue is, is I mean, again, yeah, it's an example of how, frankly, how we're not very good at having these conversations anymore. I mean, I, yeah, I think I, I suspect most people looking at this question of you know march not march would probably be thinking, okay, look, yeah, we definitely are not a country where we want to ban marches because we think somebody might say something we don't like in advance. That's not where we are. Do we want people disrupting the cenotaph and Remembrance Day? No, we don't. But it's surely possible to. Uh, you know, to march to say I dislike the tactics, the policies of the Israeli government without descending into from the river to the sea yeah. annihilation of Israel. 
you know, and that's probably why I, mean, I still think most people in the country are, are in that reasonable middle. They don't want protest banned. They don't, you know, you know, and they don't want Isra Israel you know, annihilated. Fortunately, I mean, we, you know, we are you know, we're still yeah. a reasonable a reasonable country, despite yeah, despite you know, what people on you know, the extremes extreme voices on either either side of this would try, would try and have you believe. But I, I guess James, the, um, the, the question comes down to how many people in those marches actually have you know underneath it all a more of an anti-Israel stance than a pro-Palestinian one. We saw. Uh, just last night, the Rochdale cenotaph being vandalised with "Free Palestine" written on the side of it. Nobody's going to, no sane person, one would have thought, would want to support that. But are we going to see more of that? What about security in this country? I mean, surely security services must be, at the moment, in a heightened alert for uh, the potential of an increase in something like this to something more sinister. No, vandalising memorials, anti-Semitic graffiti, all terror, awful, awful. And yeah, that, that is why we have you. The police should enforce and prevent and stop yeah, and stop crimes like that in terms of security. I, mean, I think the, yeah. Yeah, the the police are on record as saying there is yeah, they they, yeah, they are increasingly concerned about you know, the possibility of domestic terrorism. They're encouraging people to you know, to to contact the domestic terror hotline. Um, so yes, that's a it's a worry. Well, James Kirkup, thank you so much for joining us this morning.